Alrighty. So um, good afternoon. This is uh, the Bayesian machine learning class. Um, this lecture is about vector graphs. And um, yeah, before we start, before I take your questions, I want to make some comments about vector graphs. But before that, the first comment I want to make is uh, you are probably aware that there is a poll on the uh, on Piazza. Um, because our lecture on the 24th of December has been cancelled. We have to find a new date. And um, I don't think we could do it before that. Because the, uh, basically uh, we are, well, the schedule is full before that. So we have to do it after the, um, the holiday season. And in order to not mess up the entire schedule, my suggestion is to do it in either Monday, I think Monday the 10th of January or Tuesday the 11th, but you can see it in the poll. So if you haven't filled out the poll, just go to Piazza and please indicate your preference. And then in uh, in a few days, we'll, I'll just take the one that has the highest number of votes and then we'll schedule the class uh, at that day. Um, and in the end, as usual, even if you cannot attend, we we'll record it and we post it on the website. So then about factor graphs, just some um, comments on, on this lecture. It, it may seem a bit of uh, a completely different thing from what we've been doing, right? And, uh, and that's entirely true. I think that with lecture four, you basically know everything that there is to know about Bayesian machine learning, uh, aside from computational details. <laughs> um, the whole idea is you if you have any machine learning task, you propose a model, uh, you collect your data and you and your model is a prior and a likelihood, right? Uh, once you have the data, your data generating distribution, you can plug in the data and it becomes a likelihood function of the parameters of your model. And then all you need to do is uh, refactor that prior likelihood into two other factors, namely a posterior distribution and an evidence. The posterior will tell you, will probably solve your problem uh, because your problem will, or uh, your problem may be some, to know some hidden state, um, or you can use the posterior to solve your problem. And the evidence will tell you how good is this model if you know, if I uh, compare it to another model that I may take tomorrow or the day after, and then I can just um, keep keep evolving to better and better models, right? Um, now, what factor graphs do is to make it computable for larger models. If you have if you have a model with three variables, it's I mean, you it's not a real problem to do Bayesian inference, right? Um, but if you have a thousand variables, then yeah, uh, the the it, it's just uh, too too many variables to compute all the dependencies and uh, to integrate over, let's say, uh, to integrate over all the other uh, variables, right? So what factor graphs do is they say, well, if your model, if there are independencies in the model, and when you have a lot of variables in your model, that almost always is the case, right? I mean, if you have a model of millions of variables, it's very unlikely that each of those millions of variables directly depends on all the others. Um, so if, if it is the case that each variable only directly depends on a few other variables, then you can write your model basically as a factorization of those relationships between a few variables. And once you can do that, then Bayesian inference turns into a message passing algorithm. Um, and what a factor graph does is two things. One, it visualizes your model. This is very useful. Um, if, if your model consists out of 10 equations or more, yeah, it's very hard to visualize from the equations what's really going on in this model, right? So to actually draw a, a factor graph where you can actually see the relationships, which variables related to which variable, which variables are observables, which variables are parameters, that 
really helps, particularly for larger models. So just that would already be uh, a nice thing. The other thing is it comes with a framework for doing inference, right? Uh, factor graphs allow you to interpret Bayesian inference as message passing between, uh, between the nodes over the edges. Um, and, um, and in the end, since usually every node only does an elementary thing like do an addition or the node is a Gaussian uh, function or the node does uh, yeah, an equality node as you have read about, just very elementary things that we can put the Bayesian update equations for those elementary nodes in a lookup table. And then if you do message passing, well, you, you can imagine this as basically every time when you hit a node, you just go to your lookup table and you see the equation that you have to carry out. Well, you have to plug in, of course, the current values of the variables, but then you just plug in your current variables in that equation, you carry it out and you pass new messages, you get to a new node, and in that node, you do the same thing. You look at the lookup table. Okay, equality node. What is the update rule? Um, multiply these two numbers. What well, you do it, and and so forth. So you can imagine that you can then write a toolbox for that, and the toolbox would have, have a, a a whole palette, a whole set of nodes that occur a lot in machine learning, Gaussian distributions, additions, multiplications, all these elementary operations and these elementary probability distributions. And so you can write the toolbox for that and then well, basically you can automate inference, right? You would still need to write your, um, your gen data generating distribution and your prior. But in principle, you would then just say, uh, press a button and say, do inference. Um, strange enough, there aren't a whole lot of toolboxes that do this well at the moment. Uh, if you want to implement this, it turns out to be a lot harder than it, uh, than it seems at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, our lab is implementing a toolbox like that. It's called Fournier Lab, and you'll work with it later in this uh, in this class. There are just a few others also in the net, but I think, let's say, if we take 10 years from now, that most of machine learning will be that. You, you, you will write down a generative model, your prior and likelihood, uh, in your programming language. And then you just say, and these and these variables is what I want to infer, and you just press a button. And then inference will be automated, right? Um, through a factor graph or there are other methods. But for large models that are sparse, that are not highly densely connected, factor graphs and message passing is just the, the most efficient way to do it. So that's why this is an important topic. Um, and I think in the in the in the future, factor graphs may for a large degree start to automate machine learning and, and AI because nearly every question, relevant question in machine learning and in AI, you can pose as a conditional probability, right? What's the probability that X belongs to this class given these observations? What's the probability for the future given the past? What I mean you can keep going on and on. So um, yeah, so I think that factor graphs will become very important in the future. Now in this class, this introduction is, is very cursory, right? Um, it may even be a bit difficult to follow. So I gave you also uh, the beginning of another paper to read by Hans-Andrea Luliger and um, a student of Hans-Andrea Luliger, uh, Frederic Faden, did a nice presentation. So I would like you to look at my lecture notes and also the paper and, and get a good idea of factor graphs. But I'm not going to ask you deep things about factor graphs on the uh, on the exam, so don't get too uh, nervous about it. Um, the I think the um, the exercise on factor graphs that's in the exercise section is representative. Basically, you are asked to what is a, a good schedule for this, right? Or if I give you a model 
draw the vector graph and draw a proper uh, message passing schedule. Uh, that's about the extent that, that I'm going to ask you about. So nothing too deep. Um, towards the end of the course, you will work with Fournier Lab. So um, I expect you also to solve simple problems with Fournier Lab. And, uh, and that's about the, the extent that we're going to use it. Um, so this lecture, I give it now right after this basic machine learning class. In the past, I would put it always almost in the end uh, because it's, that seemed a nice fit because then you've had inference problems to cope with in the in the forthcoming lectures and you would kind of start to realize how difficult it is to actually compute to actually do inference so you have more motivation for factor graphs now that real motivation isn't there yet but by putting it up front it will be easier in the future to actually draw a factor graph for um, let's say for a model so there's pro and cons for where to put this uh, chapter for now it's uh, it's here um, yeah, with that, I want to give yeah, basically the floor to you and uh, propose that you, if you have any questions about this class or any of the previous classes for that matter, but let's 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 try to focus first on this class. Um, then please either raise your hand or just uh, break in audio or say something in the in the chat. Yeah, Sveta. Uh, Hi, so I have a couple of questions. Oh, okay. Um, so my first question was regarding uh, configuration. Uh, yeah, actually regarding uh, configuration. Um, so it says that uh, configuration is valid only if uh, f of w is not zero. Um, and that uh, configuration means that you assign values to all variables. So I would like to know why we require that f of w is not zero? Yeah, uh, it's it's not something that we really use um, la uh, later on in the class, right? But um, later you, I mean, when if you look at the whole lecture, you'll see that this f represents a probability distribution, right? And um, what we don't want to choose is values for the variables x1, x2, et, et cetera, that makes the probability zero, right? Uh, th that's not something that can happen, right? Th that, let's say that assignment of values cannot happen because the probability is zero. So that's why we say uh, we, in a factor graph, the formalism is that, um, yeah, basically you can you you can say that the these uh, these nodes f are sort of constraints. They they constrain the relationships between x1, x2, x3, and x3, x4, x5, and only assignments to the variables that obey the constraints is what we call a valid assignment. It's not something that we use, but that's um, yeah, that's how, how how we call it. Can you kind of understand that? Yeah, yes, yeah, no, it makes okay. more sense now. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, could you briefly touch upon uh, auxiliary uh, variables? Um, I kind of get what is happening, but it, it's still a bit uh, blurry. Okay. Uh, okay. So let me then just share my screen. Um, Yeah. Just a second, my teams, if I do that, then my teams completely disappear and I want to kind of, yeah, okay. So uh, I hope you can see my cursor also. I uh, Let's say I have a function here, right? This, think of this as a probability distribution over X1, X2, X3, X4. And we assume that this probability distribution breaks down in, three factors. Now, what you'll see is um, you, fa is a function of x2, fb is a function of x2, fc is also a function of uh, x2. I can't draw a graph where x2 uh, is associated with an edge, right? 
because well an edge has only two two ends right so we have to do something and so what we do is we say now rather than this graph because i cannot draw this i can't draw a factor graph for this graph i'm going to draw a factor graph for another uh, uh another uh, another probability distribution g or another function which is a function of x1 x2 x2 prime x2 double prime x3 x4 and this is just defined as follows fa over x1 x2 fb basically in the same way but for fb and fc rather than x2 i just write x2 prime and x2 double prime and I add another function. And this function is what we call an equality node. And it, all the equality node says, well, x2 prime has to be the same value as x2, and x2 double prime has to be the value, same value as x2. Now, x2 prime and x2 double prime are different variables. I could have called them uh, y and z. That would also be fine. But if I now draw the, but if I now look at G, um, you will not see any variable that occurs more than twice, right? Uh, X2 is here, but X2 is also here. X2 prime is here and here. X2 double prime here, X4 is here. Uh, so every variable occurs at most two times. So I can just draw the graph for this. And this is the factor graph. But Can I, I break in for a moment? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. If uh, x2 and x2 prime are equal, yeah. then uh, the thing between the brackets after the delta pulse becomes zero. Then the whole factor is equal to zero, right? No. So, sorry, uh, the delta means... Actually, I didn't write that down. Okay, the delta uh, means that only if x2 and x2 prime are the same value, um, then indeed x2 minus x2 prime is zero and delta of zero is one. Uh, okay. Yeah, so the, uh, so this is the, the yeah, but this is the, the Dirac delta or the Kronach mm -hmm. delta. And, um, yeah, then so, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so it's only if, if the argument of the delta equals zero, then the, the delta evaluates to one. So, this function only evaluates to one if, if x2, x2 prime, and x2 double prime have the same value. So they are, they are constrained to have the same value. They are, th I mean, they are different variables. They just are constrained to have the same value. So computationally, it's the same thing as having f, right? There is nothing more to infer here. I mean, they're constrained to the same values. Right, so the, the, the posterior over x2 and x2 prime and x2 double prime will always be the same. Um, uh, and um, But now I can draw the graph and I can do message passing on this thing. And uh, so it, it's just a trick. These x2 prime and x2 double prime, I call them here auxiliary variables or extra variables, you can call them whatever. It's just creating a branching point, really, right? I mean, uh, here's x2. And you want to connect x2 both to fb and to fc well i only have one endpoint here so i just create a branching point then here x2 <laughs> x2 prime goes to fb but x2 prime has the same value as x2 and x2 double prime goes to fc but it has the same value of x2 so it's just a branching point is is that clear yeah um uh, so um, I have a question. Um, uh, so we need to know which variables depend, which parameters depend on each other, and which ones are independent, right? Uh, so this need, this information should be given to the toolbox, and only then it can possibly construct the FFG, right? Yeah. So when you are going to, I mean, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, look, f factor graphs do not necessarily demand that these functions are probability distributions. Perhaps for the class, it would have been easier to just assume that. But, but technically, it also works if they are not probability distributions. So, 
but uh, realistically, the way we use them is we say, oh, here is my my model. Is it just a distribution over all my variables? Some of these variables are, let's say, parameters, right? X2 and X1 and X2 may be uh, theta1 and theta2, and X3 through uh, X5 may be observed things, observations, right? So um, but these are just all the variables in the model, and then you make your um, uh, you make your, your your model assumptions, right? It it could be, let's say, that this this p over x four is a prior on the parameter x four, and this is a likelihood function for uh, x three and x five could be observations. X four is a parameter, right? And here's an uh, well, let's say x three is also a parameter, and then. Uh, uh, x1 and x2 are observations. So, so this is how your model assumption is. You create this model. You create your how it's factorized, and um, it's usually informed by yeah the physics of the problem that you're modeling. We're going to go through lots of examples of that in 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 the, in the future, right? But as you have to propose your model. But once you propose your model, and once you say, okay, this this joint distribution is basically an uh, uh, is factorized as follows. Well, then you can draw a graph like this. This graph is exactly it's just a representation of this factorization. It's nothing else. But it. it all this graph does is it say, well, uh, X4 is a component of two factors, of this factor and this factor. X3 is an argument of two factors, of this factor and of this factor. And X1 only occurs in this factor. That's that's exactly what this formula says, and it's exactly what this graph said, says. So this is just a visualization of the factorization. And you as a designer make that. And then we're going to say later on, um, oh, now suppose that X2 is observed. So as you will see later in this uh, lecture, oh, I'm going to uh, put here a black node, say it's observed. And there's a message coming out of that. That message is the delta for on the observation, right? There's a message coming out. And I can just do message passing and come up my posterior for X4 this way, or my posterior for X5, whatever I want. Um, so that's that's sort of how that works. Um, yes, yeah, so my question is more about um, your point on uh, how these toolboxes can help in automating this in the future for Bayesian machine learning. So, um, so then we need to give uh, this information to uh, to the toolbox to be able to use it, right? So yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, so if we then go all the way down, so I mean, we 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 uh, I, I notice here we say, well, if if th this may be our graph, and then we say, oh, but now let's say y is observed, so something has changed. I want to use this information. I want to update my beliefs over. X2 because I mean I have new information. Y is observed and yeah, X2 is related to Y through this graph. So then what we do is we 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 basically add a node here and that node is delta Y minus three, which just means that Y has been observed at the value three and yeah, there's a message coming out and together with this message from FA to FB, you can just compute the message to X2 and that is the update for X2. So if we, in the example, you know, independent now of what the particulars of this example is, if we go to the code, what we do is we just write here on uh, a generative model. You say, well, W, yeah, I have a prior over W, X, Right, and then X2 and DT are just variables. Uh, in, in order to generate Y, which is also a random variable, I say, well, that is a Gaussian of DT, and DT is the dot product between X double XT and W. So this is this just is a generative model. This is just how is the data YT generated 
basically from XT. That's what it describes. Now, the next thing I do, so here I've generated my model. The next thing I do is not uh, write down the update equations. All I say is in, in Fornilab, build a message passing algorithm. <laughs> and, right, I mean, uh, this is it's not very pretty, but it says here, get the source code <laughs> and uh, and just get my posterior, just step through it. <laughs> Right, I, I I didn't say here how to do inference. I just say, well, build a message passing algorithm, and it will do, and it, it gets me the algorithm, and I can, uh, and if I step through it, now I get my posterior, and then I plot that, right? There's some plotting, and then you'll see that okay, so based on the observations, there is a probability distribution over curves, and here I've drawn, I don't know, like six, seven of those curves. I have. I don't know, uh, maybe 20 observations or something. So I cannot be 100% sure what the underlying curve was. But, you know, I mean, uh, pretty sure, right? I mean, the, the, these are all curves drawn from the probability distribution. Um, and, but crucially, I didn't really write down my Bayes rule here. I, I, I just said, build a message passing algorithm and underneath, what Fornilab will do is it builds these messages, right? And then it will execute message one, message two, message three, message four, five, six, seven, eight, and then it will just give back to you uh, the posterior distribution over W. And that's what we did here. We just say, oh, uh, just basically pulls pull 10 samples or whatever out of the posterior distribution for W and draw the curve. And then you see these curves, right? So now for a simple model, this is, uh, you, you, you could probably if you spend some time in it also for a linear regression, come up with an analytical answer. But if this model, let's say would have 300 variables, you don't want to do that anymore. You just uh, you don't want to do Bayesian inference by hand. You just want to use something like this. Build your model. The model are just your constraints for how you think the data is generated, and then you do inference in the model automatically by uh, a probabilistic programming language. And Fornilab is such a probabilistic uh, programming language. The difference between a probabilistic programming language and a normal, let's say, non-probabilistic programming language is that in a probabilistic programming language, you can declare that W is a real, but it's a random, it's, I don't have to assign it a value. I can just say, well, whatever I know about W is this probability distribution, right? Um, let's say that, I have a jar with a, a lot of beans inside, millions, right? And I need to use the number of beans in some further computation further on. And um, well, the first question I asked you is the number of beans a random variable, yes or no? And it's, uh, it's the same. <laughs> it's the same question as that for the speech signal random. In my view, it's completely deterministic. It is just a value, right? The number of beans is whatever it is, uh, a million, five hundred thousand, three hundred and twenty, whatever it is. It's just that you don't know that. <laughs> so all you know about that value is uh, you have to describe your knowledge with a probability distribution over the values that you consider possible. And so you get a probability distribution for the number of beans. You say, well, maybe it's a million something something, and maybe it's a million something something and so you get this big probability distribution and then you just want to compute with that use it just as if it's some value and that's what probabilistic programming language will do for you you can actually declare variables as random variables and 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 and, and say their value is not the real value five but it's i express the value by a probability distribution by a gaussian and i can still do all my computations, I can still do X times W, even though W is not, is, is, is a Gaussian, right? So underneath, that means you need to have, well, uh, 
probability theory, you need to be able to, uh, to implement sum and product rules for lots of operations and for lots of probability distributions. And that's what probabilistic languages do. Right, um, and Bayes' rule, as you know, is just the product rule. So, if we know how to do the product rule for lots of probability distributions, then we can, you know, we can do Bayes' rule. Then, uh, so that's that's sort of how that works. Is is, is that clear? Yeah. Um... So could you go to the example, uh, the Bayesian linear regression example that's just about this? It's here. A uh, little bit more. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure why uh, we have the uh, delta function as the regression model. Yeah. I mean, it is because <clears throat> um, y of i equals, our model says, y of i equals exactly w, the inner product of w and xi, plus an, an, a noise thing, but I, I add the actual value of the noise. My state of knowledge about the noise is that I really don't know what it is. I express it by this probability distribution, but y equals W T time W times X plus this value, epsilon I. So the proper way to write this down is, is this is a del this delta function is only one if Y I minus the minus W X I minus E I equals zero. If this happens to be zero, then I'm implementing exactly this relationship, right? So that keeps this one. And that means that, okay, uh, well, that keeps this valid configuration, if you will, right? I have to obey this. I have to keep this one. I have no other, no other choice. Otherwise, yeah, the probability, if, if I choose a value for xi, w, xi, and epsilon i, that makes this unequal to zero, then delta will be zero, and the probability that that occurs is going to be zero. So that will not occur. The only way to keep a, you know, a, a probability greater than zero is to make yi exactly wxi plus ei. That's what this. Um, any deterministic relationship in, in your equations is always represented by a delta function in your factor graph. Right. The, this is just a, a way to how to write down the the addition. Is do you kind of see that? Um, e, yes. Uh, so um, my last question is um, uh, regarding um, uh, when it's cyclic. Uh, so the paper did mention that it can be made like an iterative algorithm, um, uh, but uh, I'm not really sure that I understood it well. Yeah. Um, let's say there would be a connection between, the, uh, but 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 between PW and and here the dot product, right? So I would also have uh, a connection here, another variable. So then I, you can imagine I can I can do message one and then do uh, this message and then go back to here and I go. Uh, so basically, I keep running around these messages, <laughs> right? And um, that's so basically uh, having a cycle means you, you, you're going to create an infinite message passing schedule and you have to stop somewhere. So by stopping short somewhere, you will incur, you will get a round of error. Now many algorithms in practice um, have actually worked really well in practice and, 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 and they are based on cyclic graphs. For instance, turbo, turbo decoding in communication is 
I don't know the exact details of turbo decoding, but it's a lot better than almost everything that's out there for that problem. It's based on a cyclic graph and we just stop iterating after a while. We just stop passing messages after a while. It's a message passing algorithm and we just stop after a while, right? And um and and and, and there are more examples of that. If you if you if you if you don't have cycles in your graph, then you can do exact Bayesian inference. If you do have samples, then you cannot prove that you can do exact Bayesian inference. It just turns out in practice that it still works often, but not guaranteed. Is, does that help a bit? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I have to say, if you go to cyclic graphs and you want to find theorems, then we're going really into, let's say, research on factor graphs and we're, we're taking a big step, right? So I think what I tell you is really all you need to know at this point. Um, Uh, yeah, so also I, I just realized I had one more doubt in the sum product algorithm. Yeah. Uh, um, so I, I do not get why we are multiplying uh, mu x1 that we get in the two directions. Yeah, this equation. Yeah. This equation. Why? Yeah. Uh, because it isn't it uh, doesn't the edge just should have the same message being passed. Okay, so this is the graph we are talking about, right? Yes, yes. And um, what I want and to know is, is I mean, I mean, first of all, um, I'm just this you agree with this. Let's say that this is my problem. I want to just find out what is the let's say the the the, the marginal distribution over x three, and given this distribution over x1, x2, 3, x7, it, it just happens to be defined by, well, sum out all the other variables. So that's just what I want to compute. Let's say I want to compute this. This is just a sum rule. And I just assume that this, my graph, my, my function f, my global function f, happens to be factorized as follows. That's just my assumption, my model assumption. Okay, then we can draw the graph. This graph is nothing else but just a, a visual representation of the factorization assumption in that I have here. Then all I do, I mean, this is going to be, uh, 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 actually I have six summation sign, signs here, right? And all I do is I just move stuff Let's say FC is a function of X1, X2, X3. Well, I don't have to, I don't need it to be on the right hand side of the summation over X4 and X5, and also not over X6 and X7. So all the stuff that that is not affected by the summation, I move over the summation sign. And what comes out is this. You can just figure out for yourself that if I make this assumption, then I can rewrite that that, uh, that that summation, that big summation in this way. And it just so happens, right, without explaining why, it just so happens you can prove then that the marginal for X3 happens to be a multiplication of something that we call here, yeah, the forward message for X3, this guy, the red one, and the backward message for X3, which is, is this term. It just so happens to be the case, and it's the blue one here. And now I will talk about why, why, it, why, how you can interpret that. Well, in one way you can interpret this is that what X3 summarizes is all the information that is on the left-hand side, left of, of, of let's say, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the red graph about X3. The vector graph is a graph between FA, uh, between uh, X1, X2, X3. And the relations are encoded by FA, FC, FB. And you, if you say, oh, well, but I don't really care about X1, X3, so I need to sum that out. Okay, then that's the information that the red graph has to know about X3. And that's encoded in here. And in the same way, 
the blue message is what the right graph here in blue knows about X3. And now, how are we going to combine this? What does the whole graph have to say about X3? Well, compare this just to a prior and a likelihood. The prior is a function over some parameters, and the likelihood is a function over the same um, uh, uh, parameters, right? How do you combine these two sources of information? Well, you multiply them. That's what Bayes' rule says, and it's, we sort of do the same thing here. It's it, it, so so in a sense, all this. On the one hand, it just follows from doing probability theory. I did right. I don't ponate it. It just rolls out. I didn't do anything for it. But how to interpret it is to say the red box is some information source about X3. Let's call it a prior. The, the blue box is some information source about X3. Think of it as a likelihood or the other way around. And Bayes' rule says you have to multiply them that, and then you have to normalize. right? But that's what Bayes' rule says. So um, Say where is it? Uh, go down, go down. Yes, yes. So you just have to multiply um, your yeah. What the right the right side of the graph says about X three, and what the left hand of the graph knows about X three. So in a sense, Bayes' rule just follows out of working this out. If you work this out, you will discover Bayes' rule. That's not a super interesting thing or super uh, exciting because base rule is just a rewrite of the product rule, and you, all you're doing here is is, is product and sum rules. Um, is, is, is that is that uh, do you understand that? Yes. Yeah, so, which means that uh, the direction of the arrows um, that uh, I can choose to represent in whatever way I would like it to be, right? Yeah. The edges. Let's say the connection between F A and F C. Like the uh, um, uh, you see an arrow here, and uh, earlier there's no arrow here. Technically, there shouldn't be an arrow. You don't need an arrow. This is the proper way to display the factorization. There is no direction really. It's just that once we do message passing, you'll see that on yeah, we get four, we get messages in 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 both directions. So we need to give them some some direction. And there's different ways of of of, of coming up with a notation for it. You could do it in a different way, but one way of doing a notation is let's just draw an arrow on the edge, say and call from FC to FE, the forward direction. So then this is the forward message and this is the backward message. That's just a notational thing. It doesn't mean that this graph computationally is a, is a directed graph. There is no real reason for these arrows other than just a notation, notational trick to, to, to distinguish, let's say the red message, the forward message from the backward message. So the uh, making the graph directed just helps with the scheduling then, right? It, 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 the only reason is so that this forward arrow above in, 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 the, in, this, in this red formula, mu x3, and I have a forward arrow, that means this message goes in the same direction as the, as the, as the arrow of the edge. And I have a backward message on top of this mu here, and that means that this message, mu, let's say backward message, uh, goes against the direction of this arrow, of this uh, of the arrow of the edge. It's just a notational thing, because I have two messages flowing over this edge, and I want to I want to invent a notation to. To separate this, to, to identify both of the messages. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. I will give you another trick to kind of think of um, of this. Later on, I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's in the it's in the optional slides. The sub product message for the equality node. And we will work out that basically what happens in the equality node 
is that, um, well, if you have an incoming message here and an incoming message here, then an equality note and the outgoing message, what, what is it? Well, it's just basically the product of the incoming messages. It's mu x times mu i, and then I have to plug in the, let's say, the new variable here. So we have to multiply these two messages in order to get the outgoing message. That is, and here is basically the proof for that. And that means that if you look at a vector graph, maybe this doesn't help, but if it does help, it's nice to think of it that way. If it doesn't help, just forget about it. You can just think of, let's insert here an equality note, just here in the middle. And with an outgoing edge, let's say to the top. And then I say, what is the outgoing message here? The outgoing message is the, well, according to this equality note, is the product of the two. And that sort of combines the information really from the in, from uh, this and this one. If that doesn't help, then just forget everything I said about that. <laughs> I think I think you just want to think of it as, and this is a general thing. If you have two independent sources of information about about something about variables, then you multiply the probabilities. That's what happens in Bayes rule, prior times likelihood, and that's what also happens in factor graphs. The left hand side of the graph times the information from the right hand side of the graph. So you multiply forward and backward messages. Very often in in a factor graph, you can associate the left-hand side with a prior and the right-hand side with a likelihood or the other way around. Okay, so I'm moving on to the next, on at least on my list, and that's uh, Gautam. Yes, <coughs> hello. Uh, yeah, uh, hi, I just had uh, two questions. Okay. So the first one was regarding the practical example, uh, the Bayesian regression example. Yeah. So there, uh, if you could just uh, go to the message scheduling part. Yeah. Yes. So here, uh, I, I, I was a bit, a bit confused about the message scheduling and what exactly that uh, message means. So, for example, if I take the message on the edge five, uh, so is that just a direct application of our some product rule wherein I just take the node available, which is an addition node, and then you know summate it for all other variables I was I was finding a bit hard to understand what exactly that message phi would be in this particular factor graph if you could just uh, in this particular factor graph okay yeah, yeah so it's 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 an addition node it's a plus yeah. right so then yeah. you go let's say in your toolbox to your um to your lookup table for let's say some product messages for the addition node here here you see and there you will find that in general, um, the output, the message on this, uh, on the outgoing edge is the convolution of the incoming messages, right? I mean, you could just fill this in. If you have Gaussian messages on the inputs, then you can add the means and add the variances. And, and um, so that's how, how that works out. So what, what will happen is, in my let's say in my toolbox, um, I will hit this node, and this node says, "Oh, uh, is is message four available? Yes. Is message two available? Yes. Okay. Is this a Gaussian? Yes. Is this a Gaussian? Yes. I mean, and then um, it will say, "Oh, then I know this is also a Gaussian uh, because the convolution of two Gaussians is a Gaussian." And the mean for this outgoing message is the sum of the mean of message two and four, and the variance for the outgoing message is the very is the sum of the variances. In the next class, we will learn that a Gaussian is completely represented by a mean and a variance, and so that's all that will happen there. Uh, and then I go on and I go I say, oh, I hit here the new node. Is X is message five available? Yes. Is message six available? No. Okay. Well, let's do message six. Well, happens to be observed. It's a value, so this is a delta message. Okay. Then message seven is five available? Yes. Is six available? Yes. Well, then 
dot product. Let's go to the lookup table. What do we need to do? Is this a Gaussian? Is this a Gaussian? Well, what, what happens to and so on? And then so I just and then you eventually you add uh, you add up at uh, eight and then you have a new belief over your W. And uh, you do this, I mean, you know, you can sort of see that this graph, this is then for one observation Y uh, for a particular value of X. Now, this here, this outgoing message, you can think of it as a new prior for, and I just repeat this graph and I repeat, I write down the same graph here and now with for X, I write X2 and for Y, Y2, and I do the same thing. And then I get a new update for W. And then I repeat the same graph on the right hand side here. And I will write for X, X3 and here Y3. And I just keep passing messages until I've had them all. And then, well, then I have my posterior for W. And that's Bayesian inference. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's clear now. Yeah. Okay. Maybe uh, maybe um, I, I have something to add, which maybe mm -hmm. um, uh, helps as well. So if you're um, familiar with um, neural networks or with uh, some of the software tools, software uh, packages that are available to build neural networks, they also have something called a computation graph. But what happens in a neural network is that so mathematically you might you might write this as there's some input layer, then we have some composite function to another layer and then another composite function to another layer. But all of those computations have to actually be spelled out step by step to the computer for it to be able to perform all of those computations. But within a neural network, those computations are very um, simple. They are just one plus one is two, two times three is six, etc. And we so we know all of these. So I actually have a, a good example of, of this. There's a in the TensorFlow documentation that has a few examples of exactly all of the uh, core computations used by TensorFlow to, to get from an input layer to an, uh, to an output layer. Um, so in, in TensorFlow, it's building a computation graph is it's just a matter of um, organizing all of the very specific computations that have to be done in series in, in, uh, in yeah in, in sort of a structural way, okay, first this one, then this one, then this one. We, you know, this one has to wait for the result of that one. And and the way to do that is with the graph, because the graph provides all of that structure. It's it's rich enough, it's uh, precise enough to be able to allow you to do all of those computations and get through a neural network. And the wonderful thing that that Google has done is that you can also invert this. So say that I want the the, um, the uh, derivative of something, then I, I I can look up. Okay, this thing came came in. I, I know what the derivative of this function is, so I can also compute sort of backwards uh, how I should update uh, a weight. Um, so really, these computation graphs are very common. They're very powerful. They're used in a lot of frameworks, where uh, especially machine learning frameworks, but also outside of machine learning, there are these computation graphs that really spell out to a computer which uh, computation steps have to be done all, all the way to the elemental list of operations, multiplication, addition, etc. Now, what's what's different about a probabilistic probing language is that uh, you know one plus one is two. It's very easy to to tell a machine how to do that. But uh, so now we have a, a Gaussian distributed random variable. What is so suppose that's x. X is a Gaussian distributed random variable. What is x plus two? What is x times two? What is x times y? Where y is some other uh, random variable. What if X is not Gaussian, but something more complex? What is uh, so really probabilistic programming is, is sort of the or the, or the factor graphs are, are sort of the computation graph for a probabilistic model. Um, uh, but, you know, this is all still relatively new research as so some of the operations that you might like to do in a probabilistic model are a bit um, more. They take a bit more work than um, than the uh, sort of more more basic elementary computation that you might be uh, familiar with if you've seen computation graphs for uh, for neural networks. And so so a lot of these are are very well known results from statistics. We have these analytical solutions for linear transformations of Gaussians, for instance, or or the multiple uh, the sum of two Gaussian random variables. Um, 
and then some of them are not well known, and that, that's also where research into um, Bayesian machine learning uh, is heading. So how do we, what is the result of, of taking some uh, random variable with a very complex distribution and uh, another random variable with some other weird distribution? What if we mix them in some way and, and what's the result of that? But so this idea of factor graphs as a computation graph for a heuristic model is perhaps helpful as a, uh, a mental note. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, I, I still see a hand for uh, Gautam and Olivier. Is, are you uh, through your questions, uh, Gautam? Or? Uh, yeah, I just had one uh, quick question again. Uh, so this was a bit um, uh, a practical kind of a question. So uh, you mentioned that in practical scenarios, you will have a lot of variables and then, you know, m not many of them will have dependencies with among themselves. And hence we find the factorization and stuff. So yep. uh, we were actually studying about uh, in another course, something like a, a PCA analysis, like a principal component analysis. So I just wanted to understand in uh, the refer in the reference or context of Bayesian like machine learning is PCA like do um, do people often do PCA like a first step and then go to factorization or is that a complete <laughs> wrong interpretation and do we not use that at all? No, I mean that's fine, but I mean uh, PCA by itself. I think what you want to do is look up uh, what's called probabilistic PCA. Oh, okay. um, uh, PCA can be understood as, a, as as Bayesian inference. So PCA by itself um, is also just. I mean, you, you you can write down a generative model for a principal component analysis and and see the principal component analysis as just estimation or getting a posterior over some latent variable. Yeah, we'll. Uh, I don't think we will do PCA, but if you look up probabilistic. PCA, it's in Bishop's book as well. You will find uh, it's 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 completely. You, uh, there's also a paper by Bishop on probabilistic PCA. Um, it's just uh, it's, it's really uh, you write down the the generative model in two lines, and you know in a factor graph you would just press the button. That's all there is to PCA, and. So in comparison to, let's say, the pages of derivations in other books, this this makes it this is really a, a nice framework. Yeah. So what are models where you have a lot of variables and let's say very sparse structure? Well, video processing, right? I mean, in in any image, a particular value for a pixel depends a bit on its local environment, but not on the values of the pixels that are far away. And the same thing in, in, in video and speech processing, right? The value of particular values depend a bit on its recent past, but not what happened an hour ago. So um, those are all variables that are not related to each other. So generally just processing real world data, all these models are extremely sparse, right? Um, as what we will talk about, Later, actually, maybe uh, Magnus will talk about it. The brain is a model for our sensory data, and a neuron is connected. Well, I don't know if Magnus is online, but I think a few thousand other neurons on average. And, but you have yeah. uh, you have about 10, ten to the power nine neurons in your brain. So the fraction of the, the connectivity fraction is extremely, extremely low in the brain. It's 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 almost a completely empty empty graph <laughs> in that sense. Um, yeah, so it's no surprise that in the brain inference because there is inference going on in the brain uh, that it occurs by message passing. Right? It's just a graph where the where nodes pass messages to each other. That's what's going on in the brain, and so that is a real world example of what yeah we try to sort of you know, do here with it in engineering terms, right? Um, yeah, if that Thanks. was your question, then Olivier. Yes, I was working on the exercises today, okay. but I was uh, not sure at 1A how they can conclude uh, so fast that it just was a normal distribution with uh, the mean is the product. 
and the variant. <clears throat> OK, so let's let me see if I can. Uh, find. The exercises. So the exercise for the factor graphs. Yes, correct. And then uh, the first one from state space equation to the conditional probability distribution. So this, these are the normal way that you, how you, you learn to write these equations in, uh, uh, in control theory classes, right? And then, I mean, this is not complete, right? We don't say here yet what is a prior over W and V, but we say it here. So here's the prior of W and here of V. Actually, I should write that below here, right? And um, so then we have these four equations and then the ideas, you, you don't know how you get to this. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> here I say uh, ZK. Ah, okay, so yeah, this may be a result of the, of the fact that, and I'm not sure if that's actually true, that we haven't done the Gaussian uh, class yet, because like I said, I, this, this, this factor graph class used to be all the way in the, uh, at the end of the classes. So it may be that we actually need some, uh, uh, so, 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 so know something about Gaussian distributions. But the idea is that, that ZK, this is a, ZK is a linear combination of ZK minus one, um, and CK minus one is a linear combination of CK minus two and so forth. And I keep adding a little bit of Gaussian noise, right? Mm -hmm. WK is Gaussian noise. And I start with Z zero is Gaussian. And in, yeah, I think in the, in the next class, I apologize that it wasn't, uh, so I moved this, uh, the, to get this exercise now. In the next class, you will find out that any linear combination of Gaussians turns out to be a Gaussian distributed variable as well. So we know that um, I, I, I can write this as the probability distribution over ZK is going to be a Gaussian with the mean value. Well, that's going to be the mean value of the expression on the right hand side. The mean value of WK equals zero. So the mean value of a times ZK minus one is A times the mean value of ZK minus one. And that's what you will see mm -hmm. here. Is that what we? Yeah, do? that's it, I think. OK. Good. So not I think really difficult, then. it's not difficult at all. It's just a, a little rewrite. And um, I think after the next class on Gaussian distributions, uh, this will be a triviality, but indeed you you are right that we we haven't dealt with it before. So in that in that sense, this this is, comes a little bit too early. Yeah. Okay, then I'll wait till Friday. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Thanks. Okay. Um. Okay, so we've had an an an, an hour. Um, I'm happy to continue, but I don't see any hands, and I also think. If there are no hands, then maybe we should close the session. Uh, feel free to keep asking questions in uh, in Piazza. Um, I tend to just, if there is a question, to just let it go for a few days and see if there are students that want to answer. Please, if you pose a question, I think there is a there's an option where you can say show it only to the instructor or show it to the, the, the students as well. If it's not a personal thing, but if it's just a technical thing, please open it up to everybody because then everybody can also enjoy the uh, well, the answer and they can also see uh, um, um, contribute to the answer because I wait for students to, you know, for you guys to come up with the answer just as, a, as an exercise and uh, and then I will always revisit it 
a few days later and, and, and say, oh, this is done, great, or I'll give my own view on it. Yeah, so just keep asking questions. Um, and yeah, uh, the, I really want to uh, encourage you to keep up with the class. Because that if, if you do, if you keep up with the class, then I guarantee you that the exam is not going to be very difficult. Olivier. Yeah, is there also some more uh, material to work on? Exercises, for example? No, not at the moment. I mean, we have uh, have made the two exams available and we have some exercises for each lecture. I agree if you say well that's not really um, a whole lot <laughs> but that's how it is at the moment um but th this is what we have there are of course in the book by bishop a lot more exercises but uh and you can just read the book bishop and look at the exercises i have all the answers for bishop's book as well if you if you want to the only thing is that those exercises are very um they usually uh, uh, prove this or prove that, right? And yeah, that's something that doesn't fit the multiple choice format very well. So that's why I I'm not asking them putting them in the uh, in the questions at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm, thanks. The, the main exercise I think is doing. The uh, doing the trial exams and doing the uh, and doing the probabilistic programming uh, sessions with the router. Maybe to um, to add to that. Um, so last Friday during the probabilistic programming one session, uh, someone asked whether uh, the assignments from last year could be made available uh, as exercises, uh, which I now did. They're uh, uploaded to the uh, GitHub repo, and uh, so if you go to our website, you'll see in the table, uh, you'll see W1X and W1Sol. Uh, those are links to two sets of notebooks. One is the notebook where uh, just the problem set up in a Jupyter notebook and then a few questions. And the Sol, you'll, uh, so those questions will contain bits with your code here. So you can try and solve those and see whether you get the, uh, the right answers, and then you can have a look at the solution notebook and see how uh, it was intended to be solved and whether your answer matches. Uh, where was that in the GitHub? And so, if which, you, uh... so if you go to uh, the course website, uh, uh, just BMLIP, then in this table where you would have all of the links to the videos and the lecture notes and the mm -hmm. live classes and everything, there's now also for the rows containing probabilistic programming, there's now also links to the uh, um, if you press one of the links, it'll take you to the specific GitHub page and then you can do download for that specific notebook. OK, we'll look into that. Yeah, just the course website, it's announced there and, and it, it, um, yeah, if, if you can't, um, uh, if, it, if it's not working for you, just uh, let us know. Yeah, we'll do. OK, then I think. Uh, that we're done for today, I'm going to stop the recording. Stop recording. Yep.